Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone to this evening Renaissance Live session, which is dedicated today to Mechtel Bruchem Israel's group, Piero della Francesca and the invention of the artist, which hopefully you can see on the screen. Piero della Francesca's live covers the 15th century, his dates are 1415 to 1492. So it comes from a much earlier generation than Giorgione, whom we were discussing last month. And Piero can be seen in many ways, I think, as the very opposite of the very ambiguous Giorgione, as I hope you will see and hear today, because Piero is very much an apostle of clarity and precision rather than of ambiguity, as could be argued that Giorgione was. That is, in Piero, clarity in the use of light, in the transparency of space, clarity and precision also of thinking through mathematics and geometry. So, in fact, Piero also wrote on aspects of mathematics and geometry, standing out as one of the first Renaissance artists to engage in writing with ideas and methods of representation. So to discuss Piero, I am joined by the author of the book, Mechtel Bruegel Israels, who is professor of Renaissance art history at the University of Amsterdam and a specialist of 15th century Italian art. And her interlocutor is very well known to you today, is Paul Taylor, curator of the photographic collection of the Warburg Institute, was also written not only on Piero della Francesca, but on a wide range of uh, issues related to the art history from world art to um, Dutch art and beyond. So Paul, without further ado, if you want to begin the conversation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Francois. Uh, well, um, uh, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a great pleasure to talk about Piero and, and for us it's perfectly natural that a book should be written about Piero in this series of Renaissance Lives because he's clearly a kind of central figure uh, in our view uh, of 15th century Italian painting. Um, but um, you know only a uh, hundred years ago that wasn't the case uh, and um, uh, you know if you go back to the mid 19th century when people were first getting very excited by uh, by Italian paintings, uh, you find a figure as, as big as, as Ruskin, who you know uh, adored uh, a whole range of Quattrocento and Trecento painters. Uh, he doesn't mention Piero once in his entire voluminous oeuvre, uh, despite the fact that Piero was, of course, already featured in the National Gallery uh, by 1861, and then uh, uh, by 1874 there were actually three paintings by Piero in the National Gallery. So Ruskin had no excuse. But um, after this period of, of neglect, even by great lovers of Quattrocento painting, he's gone on to be one of the, the, the key figures uh, in, uh, in our understanding of Renaissance art. And I was wondering if we could just start by, by asking a little bit um, about that, Magda. It's actually the last chapter of your book where you um, address this issue, but um, we agreed that it might be interesting to discuss this at the beginning. Uh, and in particular, perhaps, perhaps we could start by looking at uh, what is possibly his most famous painting, which, uh, which you have uh, on the screen. Um, yes. and, uh, and that's The Resurrection um, uh, by, uh, by Piero. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, let's um, I'm sort of talk about the, uh, the, the, the this painting was, was considered by Aldous Huxley to be the greatest painting in the world. Um, and uh, and we, we happen to know that Aldous Huxley's opinion uh, was one of the reasons that the uh, the picture survived uh, because a, a British artillery officer had read it. Do you want to sort of tell us about that actually, uh, Mashkin? Yeah, thank you very much, Paul and and Francois for um, for organising this this dialogue, this discussion of of Gero's work. Um, no, it's a wonderful painting to start with because um, indeed it's it's the British who discovered it and who saved it. Um, um, yeah, it might be funny that maybe that uh, in mid 19th century when Gale was being rediscovered, um, maybe especially in France, think of Pierre Puy de Chavan, um, and was not that much appreciated in, in England yet. Um, I think, um, Roger Fry, who only later in 1901 uh, gave lectures on Piero in Cambridge, um, commented on the fact and uh, said that maybe um, um, the British um, were at that time too pre-Raphaelite to look much at Raphael's precursors. 
Um, but whatever the case, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, that was reversed. There was, of course, this, this modernist, postmodernist interest in Piero because of his um, sense of shape of of the a geometric a geometrical essence to to forms um for which fry was very much the apostle and who knows whether aldous huxley indeed knew of fry because he wrote that wonderful essay in 1925 in which he calls this painting uh, the greatest picture in the world um uh, commenting in fact on the way in which um above all form is is treated and the way the the viewer is roped into it is enthralled by it and in fact as you said paul um there was um anthony clark who had to bomb at san sepulcro at the end of the second world war and uh, said wait a minute is it isn't san sepulcro the place where the greatest picture of the world um, is supposed to be because of his reading of Aldous Huxley's uh, essay. And then he um, took the audacious step not to bomb the city, which is why we still have this magnificent painting. And that's one of the other reasons, of course, that um, uh, Piero maybe was rediscovered later because although the National Gallery is so fortunate to own three of his paintings, it is not as though you can find them easily in the best visitors visited Italian tourist cities. Um, Florence um, comes to mind, of course, but um, and you have to, to work to, to get to him, to, to actually see him, and also you have to work to, to figure out yeah, what he meant. <laughs> yeah. I, I was rather moved earlier on this afternoon. I was doing a bit of uh, hunting on, on Google Maps and I found Via Anthony Clark in San Sepulcro. Uh, so they've named a street after the man who didn't uh, bomb the town. He was going to live a shell it. He was an artillery officer. Uh, I, I thought that was really rather nice. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, also Huxley's essay is, is well worth reading and you can find it online and you can download it and I recommend it because it's, uh, uh, it's a really good piece of, of writing. One of the, the nice sentences um, here is a, um, a natural, spontaneous and unpretentious grandeur. This is the leading quality of all Piero's work. Um, mm. And it sort of, you know, gets to the heart of what we see in him. But I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know. I have no idea why Ruskin ignored him. But I can imagine that one of the reasons he might have done was because he thought that he wasn't particularly um, uh, accurate uh, when it came to certain aspects of his painting. I mean, uh, can we move on to the next slide and, and, and zoom in a bit on, on the figure of Christ, um, uh, Magdal? Um, yes. Um, I mean, Piero always has, I mean, Piero has a small number of facial types and, 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 and he often uh, has these very long noses and eyes very wide apart. Um, the distance between the nose and the lip is often quite small. He, he's got a real physiognomy. Um, but I mean, to us, this looks solemn and you know full of grandeur. Um, but perhaps to to earlier um, sort of you know writers, it just looked naive. Uh, and I was wondering if um, uh, you've sort of come across early writers who comment on the naivety of Piero and and, and criticise him for that. Um, yes, I think. Um... It's Lady Eastlake and also Crow and Cavacaselle who, who comment in a negative way on, on that quality, which becomes a positive quality later on, and I think still is. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's this fantastic, um, he could be a peasant, maybe a Tuscan peasant. At the same time, it's, it's a frightful face, though, and there is this slight as asymmetrical aspect to it, which makes it turn a bit, which makes it very human. It is it is easy to relate with. It's not the graciousness of a Botticelli if you were to look for that, but it's it's harrowing and you're, you're looking into the eyes of somebody who himself looked death in the face. And that in the end is what the painting is about. Very, Pio is very precise about um, his subject matter, um, not enigmatic at all, I think, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, <laughs> um, and has a way of, of putting the truth in front of you, but also inviting you to 
unravel it by means of of his um, yeah his maybe you're wrong to say clues but but by by the way in which he constructed um, the image and and he invites you to unravel that um, and that's how <laughs> yeah the message of the image is also conveyed. Well, uh, Michael Baxendall wanted to write an entire book on this painting, and I'm sure that we could keep talking about it easily for an hour. <laughs> we could keep talking about it for, for you know, a whole day. Um, just to pick up on one thing about did Aldous Huxley know Roger Fry? Well, I think they knew one another personally because they were both um, guests, I think, at Garsington Manor with Ottilie Morel on the Bloomsbury set. Uh, and so um, he almost certainly did know about, um, you know, Fry's view of Piero, even if he hadn't actually read his... Uh, um, his work. Um, before we leave this picture, there is just one thing. I was very interested in your book to see that you think that the soldier who is second from the right is uh, kneeling on uh, on his legs, so to speak, because we can't see his legs, and there's always been a mystery as to where his legs have gone. Um, but uh, uh, is that generally accepted amongst Piero scholars now? Well, it is among my students. When um, when I go there, I have them pose in the exact order <laughs> as as the soldiers uh, do. And it is if you if you sit on your knees, it's it, it explains the height of the face of uh, of that uh, soldier. And okay. it's so important, of course, because the great and that is what Baxendale wrote about uh, the great invention of the painting um, is that you look at the soldiers from below and you're standing below the image, um, although we are not exactly sure where in the wall it was originally positioned because it's been transferred. Um, but you look up at them and then, of course, um, Pierre shifts his perspective. Um, this is Baxendale and you, you look um, Christ in the face, and which has a lot to do, of course, with Pauline visions of um, seeing in a clearer way in in the beyond. <laughs> well, perhaps we should move on because uh, um, time is is much shorter than we would like, and and and, um, uh, and I know you've got um, um, interesting things to say about this because I've been looking at your PDF and I've been very mystified by your next two slides. So I'd like to hear what what it is that you're going to be telling us about it. Okay, okay. I've committed the great crime of drawing on Piero's paintings, which I rather dislike and which has been done too much. But um, I'm, I went to Monteri again to look at the Madonna del Parto. So much, of course, and so, so much wonderful things have been written about these paintings. Um, but it is this, as you can see, very fragmentary um, fresco, which has also been transferred. And here, some explanation is needed. We're all looking at our screens, but this was in a small church close to or Monterki, which is uh, the town where Piero's mother was born. And initially you would have entered the church and found this fresco, not on the high altar where it was later on, but at your left. And I mean, it is a, a shock and a revelation because you have, if you look closely at the back, you can still see that wonderful, those marble slabs that Joe is so fond of. And then in front of it, you have this incredibly luxurious pavilion with that beautiful agricha pattern of brocade, the most expensive that is to be found, lined in this squirrel fur and it is this royal pavilion is being opened for you by these two angels and there stands in the same way maybe Paul as you remarked on Christ we've just been looking at but um, a rather plain if you want figure of the virgin very young um, very pregnant um, and also very intimate. I mean, Renaissance women would never show themselves in public without their hair covered if they were married. And here she is with hair uncovered and with just her underdress. So we find her in great intimacy and it's this opening, the angels open, she opens her dress um, to us. Um, and um, so this, this, this the shock of viewing actually, um, and then when I returned, the fresco has been detached. It's now in a museum where it shouldn't be. Um, 
and restorers have reinserted it in, uh, in a new support. Um, but when I look closely, and this is to explain the lines, or if you look at them, so if you look again here at that, those marble slabs, you can see that they are not aligned according to a horizontal, the way the image is now presented. So if you do that, yeah, so you have to slightly, it's just a slight angle, you have to turn the image as it were, um, so, so that they align with the horizontals of the marble slabs in the background. And then it looks like this, I should zoom out, which, which is uh, so very much Pierre because there's, it's such a symmetrical composition, but there is a slight shift in it. And even more, if you re-imagine the fresco in this way, whereby if you enter and you find the fresco at your left, it is even more accommodating huh? and, and they're really turned uh, towards you. So that was also just to show that, of course, research goes on, <laughs> um, but also insights in, in, in how Pierre presents his subject matter in here, uh, the pregnant virgin. You, you find this feature also in old photographs. Um, I mean, it's not something that's come about due to the recent restorations then, uh, Machta. No. No. Okay. I think uh, what has been done is they aligned the feet of the angels, but did not look at the admittedly very fragmentary um, architectural background. Okay, okay. Um, and these angels are exactly the same size, and it's just a cartoon being flipped over, we think, still, right? Or, or, or yes. did you question that now? Okay. No, no. So it's, it's, it's indeed a cartoon that has been flipped over. Um, which is why they are almost the same. And then of course there's this wonderful balancing of colors huh? because Pierre is often admired for his forms, but he's just as fine a colorist in the way he balances it out, balances it out by, by choosing um, different colors for the wings, but also something else for the, for the feet. Huh? This one angel is this beautiful red, oh. Byzantine princess red um, <laughs> shoes or, um, yeah, and and um, that's that's again that that beautiful balance in form, but at the same time slightly off center. And if it were completely symmetrical, it would be an annoying image. Here, of course, you have that turn to look at her feet, at the Virgin's feet, but it's so very much the contraposto in thinking about her weight, and her weight is so important here because she is pregnant. And then there is also. And that's why I love to show this after the resurrection. It's such um, a female <laughs> image because it's so terribly soft. Now that her skin, whether we can zoom in, but, but that face is such a marvel of, of softness. Uh, Pierre often uses fingers to, to blur uh, transitions. It's quite something for an artist who has grown up in the temperate, mm. whereby you can see individual brush strokes. Um, and um, another thing that the restorers found is that he probably mixed milk through his um, uh, pigments um, so as to achieve that lighter and smoother effect huh? and look also at the way in which the fur has been rendered behind her face which makes it so so tender and intimate which is so very much part of the, of the message of the of the image too and i can just ask about the the condition of the image because the the, the dress of the angels the, the the folds are very clearly modeled in light and shade but then on the the figure of the virgin itself it looks as if it might be um, rather abraded i mean other views on, on what may have happened um, um here well, the, the recent restoration of the of the resurrection um, has shown that um, folds such as this one um, in the drapery were also glazed over. So Piero is really he's such an experimental painter. So you, you might think of this as a fresco initially, but he did a lot um, a secco, so adding details later, both in tempera and in uh, oil. So a lot of that detail has gone, which means that. Um, the modeling may have been softer than it appears now. Mm -hmm. And um, in the Virgin, I mean, blue is very, is notoriously difficult to apply in fresco. So that is indeed abraded and has lot, lost some of its modeling too. Um, and then there's also, um, there, there was a veil, uh, 
that also <laughs> softened the contour of the face of the Virgin. And you have this I mean, crazy things such as this. People have at times thought that it would be a reflection of a pavement or a floor below uh, the Madonna del Parto, but it is actually um, the individual um, gold leaves that he applied and the transitions or the, where they overlap that have braided. So yes, you have to mitigate your view and know um, what the condition did to the painting and how it altered. Was she originally, did she originally have a gold brocade dress? Did she have yeah. a gold brocade dress? No. Yeah. No, it looks like there's a sort of hint of a pattern on it, that's all. Yeah, I think it's the crackle and then okay. the, the paint. So. But I, I guess the ultramarine is, is a very expensive color in itself and it brings a, an element of preciousness to the dress, is that so? Yes, you know, the blue is, um, I think here, I don't know, it might actually be azurite, but you have to forgive me for not knowing that. But mm -hmm. yes, it is, um, it is a very uh, expensive color, which it was both in, in actual dress and in painting. So um, yes, she is, she is simple, it's just her gamura, uh, but it's also precious um, and precious as a pigment. Um, at the same time, I mean, she's not in that, in that royal um, brocade um, and um, blue, one has to know, of course, is also the color of the Virgin. So it's hard to figure out exactly whether it is just, just to say about ultramarine, um, I mean, some artists, including Sassetta, on which, of course, you're a great expert, Marcatel, would use uh, ultramarine all over their, um, their, their paintings for steps, for little details here on their walls. I mean, we tend to think, oh, they would only have used ultramarine for the Virgin, but it's not, it's not right. They, they would often use ultramarine in other places. And in fact, there's a painting in the National Gallery where some of the subsidiary characters are wearing ultramarine and Christ is wearing smalt, which is discolored and turned brown. So, uh, and so you know, um, uh, yeah, we, we need to sort of back away from some of the ultramarine claims, yeah. I think. Yes, and this is, of course, a period in which um, the artist's contribution can be more precious than the materials. So, mm. <laughs> the abraded nature of her dress makes it all the more beautiful, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think our 21st century eyes love Piero too because of issues of condition. <laughs> mm. Well, we can return to that later, but um, but uh, maybe we should move on. Um, let's, uh, yes. um, ah. Tell me what you want to know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh everything, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously, it's uh, it's Piero's um, sort of biggest and most prestigious um, uh, 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 commission, uh, and he uh, um, and if we sort of move on to the next slide, I know we're going to see the 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 general layout. Oh, actually, one thing I'd like to know is that was that your photograph actually? No, no, this is um, as you can see, it's taken from Alessandro Angelini's book. Uh, okay. No, no, I was thinking about the other, but no, anyway, never mind. Now here we are. Now um, perhaps we don't have time really to go through. Um, all of this very complex um, thing. Perhaps we could move on to uh, the Queen of Sheba. Um, yes. and, uh... yeah. no, so this is um, uh, one of the, quickly go back, huh? but, but, but here, so it's, it's this um, cycle of the um, legend of the true cross, which is a millennial story, of course, so Piero had to juggle time very carefully. Um, Marilyn Ehrenberg Levin also did wonderful work on, on the why of the narrative disposition of this uh, cycle. And I've chosen just the one um, scene here, where actually it's one scene and two episodes, um, in which you, you can see Piero, the narrator, at, um, at work. Um, so at the left, you see that um, a royal party has just dismounted. You see those wonderful horses seen from the back, uh, which might also make you think of not only Domenico Veneziano, but also um, Pisanello, um, whom I think had a lot to do with uh, Piero's formation. We're in the 1450s here. Um, and you see um, here the royal party and um, the queen herself, so she's the queen of Sheba, and you can see that Piero was aware of where she came from. Uh, so it would have been present-day Yemen, but you 
you see that one of her servants an attempt has been made here to render um, uh, the, her provenance. Um, and you see her kneeling in front of that beam that has been thrown over a river. And that beam, of course, is the wood um, that has been taken from a tree from paradise. And the wood will eventually be turned into the wood of the cross on which Christ will be crucified. And then at the other side, you see her again. Maybe you should shift this a bit so that you... I hope you can all see it. But you see her again right here. Um, and now she is, um, she's just been kneeling and um, the one who's receiving her is Solomon is helping her get to her feet again. Um, and you see again this wonderful um, idea of Pierre had to repeat um, a cartoon. So the cartoon for her here is the same as that at the, um, at the other side. Um, so that you understand that it is the same figure, that it is uh, actually about two episodes uh, taking part. Uh, and it's this fabulous grandeur um, also of the architecture. So you see again Piero looking at uh, antique architecture, recreating even things that did not really exist, such as those huge marble slabs behind it, huh, which is supposed to be the portico of the Palace of Solomon. You have that beautifully foreshortened um, colonnade, which really shows you Piero, the perspectival artist uh, at work, but also the narrative artist because he uses it to set those two um, episodes um, apart. So, um, yeah, a, a, a way, of course, I mean, it's very hard in painting to render time. But in this cycle, Piero had to, because it is so very much about time and about time spanning so many millennia. And here, yeah, those two consecutive episodes that are paired in a beautiful way so that it balances out. And at the same time, it, it pulls the eye forward and through the, through the story. <laughs> Yeah, the, the way that he sort of, you know, um, uses the figure behind uh, the Queen of Sheba and just sort of flips around, you know, flipping cartoons again is, is, uh, uh, is, is rather remarkable, I think. I mean, is this something that's very common amongst his contemporaries or, uh, or um, um, yes, I mean, that lovely woman sort of looking out at us wearing the, the blue outfit yeah. with the green sleeves, and then she's just turned around um, and uh, and put behind um, um, Solomon the next time round too, and it's, it's pretty much the same person from the same angle. Uh, but is this something that's a speciality of Piero, or do you find it a lot in in Umbrian painting of the period? So it, it has been used before. You mentioned Sassetta. He he uses it already in the fourteen early fourteen thirties in in Siena. So I mean, patterns had been used long before. <laughs> have always been used in painting. Um, but the way Piero uses it has it for narrative purposes, but also um, uh, yeah, to, to give that balance to his composition. And also, I mean, those are very clear huh, that they have been repeated. But if you look at figures such as these, it's as though it's the same person, but she has been rotated in space, which is yeah. something that requires much more uh, um, perspectival versatil versatility than the simple flipping of a cartoon, which can also be something to expedite work. I mean, it also means that you can work quicker. Think of the amount of drawings that one would have had to make, Piero had to make for a cycle of this dimension. I mean, obviously a, a lot of the, the discussion of Piero in the 20th century focused on formal aspects and on you know his construction of composition. Um, I mean, you said there, you, you, you said, you know, he wanted to balance the, the, the composition, I think, if, uh, if you use those words. Um, I, I've, I've gone looking for um, the idea of compositional balance in, in European art theory, and I've never found any um, mention of it really before the 19th century. Um, I mean, there could, there could be some out there, and I could, have, I could have missed it, but it's not a very common idea. The idea that you should want to balance your composition is, is it, it appears sort of uh, something. Um, which isn't written about at the mm -hmm. time. But, uh, but that doesn't mean to say, of course, that Piero wasn't interested in it. He may just not have written about it. Um, but um, yes, I, 
sorry. Well, I, suppose, well, yeah, I just wonder, I mean, how, how formal is he or are we reading this into his paintings? Does he have other interests and we, we read them formally? That, that, that's my question. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, in, um, you, you, you might very well be right. It's, it's an appreciative term, um, balance, and it might be 19th century, but what, what Pierre did write about is um, perspective which he calls also commensuratio, so how things relate to each other. And um, yeah, Pierre's great invention, and also one of the reasons why I called the book the invention of the artist, is this perspective and the idea, I mean, perspective is one of the greatest, if not the greatest invention of Western European painting in that it objectifies what you see so it is as you you invent um, and in Pierre's case mathematically proven um, method whereby you can render what you see huh? at the same time it becomes very subjective and and this is maybe also one of the keys um, for our appreciation of Piero uh, because it, it is it subjectifies because um, perspective, as Pierre constructs it, depends on the eye of the beholder. So from this point on, the beholder is implied in the painting, right. which is also why you're you're so terribly involved <laughs> with it. Uh, and in this case, it's as though you you hover in front of it. But I know you have a lot to tell about horizons <laughs> and Pierre's <laughs> use of it. <laughs> um, well, I don't have a lot to say about it. I published. Um, uh, an extremely short article um, um, years ago um, in the, the Warburg Journal. It was a note, it wasn't an article. Uh, it was just one side of A4 long. Um, and, and in it, I um, noted that um, a lot of Piero's um, paintings are said to be monumental. Um, and um, a lot of his late paintings are, are thought not to be so monumental. This was something that I was picking up uh, in, the, in the Piero literature, um, which I was reading. Uh, and I said, well, there could be a simple explanation for this, and that is that um, Piero, uh, in his monumental works, normally has a very low horizon line. When he constructs his perspective, then the horizon line is very low. Later on, um, he decides that the horizon line is going to pass through the eyes uh, of everyone in uh, his paintings, which is what Alberti recommends. Uh, so the horizon line comes up, but when the horizon line is low, uh, then uh, for us, it's as if we're looking at the image as if we're kneeling down, um, because uh, in order to see things from that angle, we have to be very low down to see them. Um, and this is something we don't notice with these pictures, because they often have very, very long viewing distances. So they're way out there. And what we don't realize is that actually these people are giants. Uh, these people must be about four or five times taller than us. Um, and, uh, you know, we just take them to be normal people, but they're not normal people, they're, they're, they're monuments, they're walking monuments. Um, and so that was my one page um, uh, explanation of, uh, of why the early work is considered monumental and the later work isn't. Um, it hasn't been a very widely read article, it must be said, but still, uh, it was fun writing. Has come so as Piero in his art. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we, shall we move on to uh, the next, uh, the next, oh, uh, here we go, right. Yes, so um, this is, um, it, it shows Pierre's, it's also very proudly signed, uh, Petrus Pictor Borgensis, so, so um, Pierre as, uh, signing it as a painter and from Borgo San Sepolcro, but his treatise on, uh, on perspective, which is the other great claim uh, to being an artist in a in a full Renaissance sense of uh, of the word, in that um, he was also one of the great mathematicians of his uh, of his century, and um, by uh, bolstering his art with uh, with that with mathematics, he, he claimed he had turned it into a true uh, science, and I think it's a train a claim that is. That is true. <laughs> so we've we've been looking at at horizons. Alberti um, Alberti could prove that something he had already done was correct by means of the diagonal. Pierre uses that diagonal. I think it's in the next slide. 
here, uh, uh, to in order to construct it. So he he does it ahead of time and thereby <laughs> can really um, is really in charge of that construction. Huh? And here is very, a very simple shape that he draws. Um, as though you're looking at it head on, or you're looking at it head, head on, he draws a diagonal through it, and he then uh, has this cube, he uh, foreshortens it, he repeats that diagonal on what he knows is a rectangle, or a square, sorry, and he can then plot all the coordinates against that um, diagonal, huh? which is one of the ways in which he constructs his linear perspective, but even more amazing huh? and something in which you see that it is not just perspective for space that is something that we usually associate or often associate it is with but he also does it with um with figures uh, and that's another thing um i mean he can actually construct a figure in space um completely uh, independent of um or yeah by 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 thinking of the eye of the beholder in relation to the picture surface and in relation to the object seen, huh? he, he comes up with a mathematical um, theorem, one could say, avant la lettre, uh, whereby he can construct things in space without making a reference all the time to the beholder, which is something that Leonardo later still has to do, but Piero did not. And you can here see how it goes. Huh? He has this crazy idea of drawing ahead um, in the, a frontal view, a side view, and then uh, here you see as though he is uh, it's anatomy really, but he's slicing ahead, uh, seen from the top and from the bottom in, uh, yeah, in, in several slices. And he then transfers that to other drawings eh, where he allots um, numbers to different points on the circumferences of these slices. Um, and he then transfers those drawings to a next one. And you can here see the very fine lines and show you also how precise he was in his drawings um, that all come together in a, a viewing point, which would have been the eye of the beholder. And he can then put um, in, intersect them uh, so as to plot where the uh, pictorial surface has to come uh, and, and transfer those um, coordinates to it, whereby you can have a face such as this one. It's, it's, it's the X, Y, X, Y, Z coordinates that we now use in, in uh, mathematical uh, lessons. Uh, and, and by then um, uh, yeah, applying it this way and also by then uh, shifting the head, huh? or he can actually shift the head in space. So it's it's really a, a computer program whereby he can position figures in whatever way um, he wants. So it's it's um, a second method that he designs um, really to render um, figures. And, and, and the most important or the most difficult um, example that he gives for it is actually the human head. So also this idea of actually um, creating um, creating humans <laughs> with paint and with his lines. Um, so a, a godlike um, creator, which is one of the claims whereby um, he frees the craftsman <laughs> uh, and invents the, uh, the artist. And, and here, Paul, we've been discussing it and, and it's, it seems almost unbelievable that he would have used this very complicated method to uh, design all these figures um, in, for example, the, the murals in, in Arezzo, in the Bacci Chapel, in, in San Francesco. But if you look at some single figures, I think it's, it's yeah, the correspondence is very uh, clear. And this is just that frontal view, uh, but this is another figure from the Misericordia altarpiece in which you can uh, see that he tilted the head, uh, but it is very similar. I flipped it uh, but to one of the drawings in De Prospectiva Pingendi and that he actually worked in this way and, and, and transferred such drawings that you can see by looking at them against the light and you see they're pricked. That's also transferred in this case, probably for use on another piece of paper, uh, but it's, it's this continuous process of really designing uh, figures in space. So it's like a musical composer by really uh, 
being Make that, what, what, yeah. what it does, if I, if I may interrupt you, it seems easier to teach a computer to do that than to teach a pupil in a, in a workshop. So is this his own way of understanding the world or is it something made to be taught to his pupils? Because normally painters tend to write treaties for their students to follow them like Leonardo, but that doesn't seem to be the case here, I, I believe, but uh, you're the expert. You know, um, you're the expert of the series. You know about all those artists. Um, no, I agree. It's and it's a very, um, it's very unlike Cennini. It's very unlike Alberti. The first being really, or yeah, a reflection of what happened in the workplace. Um, the second, something also to meant to elevate the art, but maybe also used to help artists. Um, uh, here, it's it's very hard to read that perspective up in Gendi, and um, we know very little about pupils um, of Pierre's. Um, but it is again, it's a claim to make um, the art of painting in something scientific, and I I actually do believe that that he used it himself to plan not only this book but also his paintings. It's it's. Yeah, um, we also know that in later, uh, in, the, in the 70s and in the 80s, he probably devoted a lot of time to writing these treatises. But if you also look at the information with which, which restorers have come up of the use of spolvero, the use of cartoons, I think it is something that he actually used to plan his, um, his compositions, yes. <laughs> When we were talking about this um, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, Magda, um, I, I asked, I, I said, well, first of all, he's got to paint a head straight on, and then he's got to do this huge sort of computation in order to turn it through an angle. Wouldn't, have been, wouldn't it have been easier just to draw it at an angle to begin with? Yes. I mean, that's what Giotto did all the time, and uh, you know, it doesn't seem impossible. Yeah, yeah but they're different artists. Huh? Um, Piero is not about, if you want, that easy kind of emotion of expression <laughs> and you you have to um i think i think that's that, 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 that's a bit harsh on giotto actually <laughs> well let me be harsh just because i have to be the apostle of piero here but okay, uh, right. so because he's he's so often been claimed to be somebody who is still who is silent who is motionless but i think but by by the way in which he selects a certain moment huh, um and therefore a certain position also of, in this case, a head, he, he is able to convey what is happening and also um, at least enable you to project and understand what kind of emotion is going on. Um, but to come back to your question, why not just paint as Giotto maybe did um, the figure as he saw it? I think it's also Cecilia Frosinini and Roberto Bellucci called it his way to turn it into a marchio da fa, uh, um, yeah, um, a mark whereby he can distinguish himself. So it's it's also something whereby, I mean, it's very easy to recognize a Piero, right? <laughs> but it, it, it's controllable. Um, and I think that's that's part of the reason. <laughs> well, maybe we should move on to um, um, the next um, um, picture, which is uh, an amazing feat of perspective and one of the most consistent, consistently worked out perspective paintings of uh, the Quattrocento or of, uh, uh, or of most periods, really, there are hardly any Seicento paintings which are this uh, mathematically precise. Um, of course, it's not just about perspective, it's also about iconography. And uh, I know that you have a, a new idea about the iconography, and, and maybe you could uh, tell us um, what, your, what your idea about the iconography is? Yeah, well, it, it, it all started with you, Paul, and, oh, you well, and Charles Hope, because you wrote such an illuminating article finally doing away with um, yeah, a lot of uh, theories, I think there are about 50 now, uh, that accrued to um, this painting that, um, yeah, I think you've shown that they are, many of them are not historically um, correct. It's, it's a biblical painting, it's a flagellation that's going on in the background. And um, you're, um, suggestion is that it's, um, or your theory is that it is a biblical painting also at the right hand side huh, of, of the picture. 
um, and, and those three figures looming in the foreground and for reasons that you also explained, the, the low horizon, that they seem so man monumental and so present, they've often been thought to be uh, very specific historical um, figures or 15th century uh, figures. Um, your idea is that it is the release of Barabbas, no? so it's, it's also related in the biblical story. And, and mine is just uh, another idea, but also still within that um, biblical context. Um, because um, if you look, and something that many people have pointed out, if you look at the figure of Pilate here, sitting in judgment in the background, who famously has that hat, uh, the schiavion, that was worn by the uh, Byzantine emperor when he visited uh, Ferrara in Florence in 38-39. Pisanello um, and Piero drew that hat and Piero often uses it when he wants to situate something in antiquity and of course the times of Christ, times of antiquity. Um, and another thing that I looked at, huh, so um, Pilate and antiquity, you have a very antique setting. A lot has been made, of course, of that strange illumination that you can see here of one of the quadrants of the ceiling. It has been thought that it was just uh, yeah, a strange hovering source of light. Um, if you look closely, you can see um, that the, uh, that the architrave, um, the lower part of it is illuminated by light flooding in. You can also see that part of the column to the side of what must be an aperture in that colonnade um, illuminates one of the columns. You can see that there is a fleck of light in the rectangular shape of what seems to be a window in that colonnade. So it, there is a play with, um, with light and um, whereby you have the light coming from the right here and coming from the left at the other side of the composition. So I've been wondering whether it could have been the passage of time and whether we are looking at something that happened in the morning, as we know the flagellation did, according to the biblical accounts at the left, whereas at the right you have something that happened in the afternoon, and we know that Christ died on the cross at three, and could it be that, as in the um, fresco in Arezzo that we have been looking at, and that we are looking at two different consecutive episodes, again set apart by that wonderfully foreshortened colonnade. And in that case, is it possible that the damaged um, face of Pilate at the left, according to that method of Pierre, whereby he can um, turn a head in space, uh, has become um, the figure at the right, but has changed dress as I think I forgot to point that out here, but you can see that the Queen of Sheba is wearing travel dress here and here is uh, wearing very royal dress when she's received by Solomon. So did Pilate also change his dress and are we looking at um, Pilate um, marveling uh, or, or being amazed or taken aback by the message brought to him by Joseph of Arimathea that Christ has already died on the cross, which is also something that you find in Mark. And in that case, the figure at the right could be Joseph of Arimathea, as he's also represented in the Flemish tradition that was so much admired at the court of Urbino, for which um, we know that this painting was uh, done. So that's my idea, and um, I know um, and various people have told me um, the, the big problem is, of course, that figure at the center uh, who is looking out at us. It's an Albertian figure who is also roping us into um, the composition. He would be maybe a helper of Joseph of Arimathea, um, as you can see also in other representations of this and similar episodes. He could be, some people have claimed, um, John the Evangelist, I don't think so because the dress doesn't correspond, there's no halo. Um, but it isn't that strange maybe to think of him as a helper if you look at dress. Huh? So also the overseer of the flagellants at the left has is barefoot, although you, Paul, make a very worthy point of saying that a, a prisoner could be uh, barefoot uh, and therefore it could be Barabbas. Um, 
but um, also if you look, and here is another image from the Arezzo cycle, so here you have Queen uh, or the Empress Helena, um, who is ordering uh, the, um, the disco or the, the crosses to be unburied, and you see all these workers uh, who are very similar to the ones you see in the flagellation, and also this figure that is so beautiful was commented on, upon by Roberto Longhi, again one of those solemn monumental peasants that you find in Piero, but if you look at that composition he has a position as important as the Empress has, uh, so Piero has a hand of putting maybe subsidiary, subsidiary figures in a very important um, position. So yeah, before we go on, but, but, but that's, that was, that's my suggestion for reading uh, this, uh, I think not three figures, but like you Paul, I think it is um, an, a biblical episode. <laughs> Well, um, uh, you, you were praising the article that Charles and I wrote. I, I have to say that I only wrote about two, two sentences in that article. Um, the whole thing was written by Charles. And the only reason he was kind enough to put my name next to his was because the idea that it might be Barabbas had occurred to me. But the, the, the analysis of the whole historiographic tradition was done by Charles and not by me. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I'm not an expert in the field. But the reason that I you know, came on the idea of Barabbas is that um, these two episodes of the release of Barabbas and the flagellation happen absolutely consecutively in all three Gospels in which the flagellation is mentioned. You know, it says he released Barabbas and then he sent Christ to be scourged in Matthew, Mark and John. And, uh, and so that was why it occurred to me that, well, maybe this figure is Barabbas. And I was rather surprised to learn from Charles that no one had suggested it before, um, because it seemed, you know, given the Bible, given the text of the Bible, it seemed like a, a rather obvious um, supposition. Um, I mean, we, we've talked about it and, you know, you've, you've told me about various problems you have with my theory and I think that they're interesting ones and I'm still thinking about them and I think your theory is very interesting too. My, my biggest worry about your theory would be why would you want to depict the flagellation and the, um, uh, the request for the body of Christ or Joseph of Arimathea talking to Pilate together because they're at different sort of parts of the, the passion story or well, one's from the passion, one's from after the passion. And um, uh, they don't seem to have any obvious reason for being together. The nice thing about the Barabbas theory is that, well, it's the same verse in the Bible, so. Yeah, but they both have to do with the body of Christ. Huh? So uh, the body that is being flagellated and the body that is being asked for, if I'm correct, in this uh, scene. And um, well, it's not the body of Christ when he's being flagellated because he's still alive. Yes, well, but it is his body, isn't it? <laughs> living body, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, anyway I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting. Um, a, a possibility there was such a, um, a devotion towards the Eucharist and the Holy Sacrament in Urbino, and one of the ideas is that it may have been um, meant for one of two chapels that are related to the Montefeltro, close to the cathedral in Urbino, and also Ottaviano Baldini della Carda, who was the brother of Federico di Montefeltro, um, occurs more often in such a context. So think also of Francesco di Giorgio, who has a deposition from the cross. Um, and something that has been noted before, but the, the mantle that is worn by the man at the right is, of course, very sumptuous um, and something in which you see Joseph of Arimathea, who is called rich in the Bible, uh, depicted above all in the Netherlandish tradition. Um, and that very um, mantle, um, I've now discovered, occurs in uh, an inventory of the, of the Palazzo in Urbino, and is, it's exactly the mantle that was worn only by Ottaviano Baldini della Carda. So there seems to be a connection. And I'm, I could think of somebody identifying with Joseph of Arimathea would, would have more of a difficulty if he were to be a, a generic Jew who is asking for the body or who is asking for uh, Barabbas to be released. But it's wonderful to continue these discussions until hopefully sometime a document <laughs> will turn up or an original context will become clear whereby we understand what's happening here. The only thing I don't believe is that Piero painted it to, in order to create a riddle or an enigma. No, I'm sure that's right. Well, we're, so, we're nearly at the end of an hour. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have, but we have time for a couple more picture and then uh, for the discussion as well. So maybe maybe we can move to the to the double portrait, uh, which is quite uh, 
quite a Piero monument. Yes. Um, no, um, just to, to, to bring you, I mean, this is very clear. Um, the court of Urbino, um, Federico di Montefeltro, famously at the right, uh, possibly because of the eye that he missed at the other side, but not in the dexter position, whereas he should be in a portrait. Um, but maybe also because of um, his love for his wife, Battista Sforza, and um, there's been discussion that's been rekindled too, but maybe it could be a wedding portrait, but I think it's very much related to the moment in which um, Battista Sforza uh, died. Uh, which was a great blow to Federico, who dearly loved her, um, so both on a private and on a public level, also because she had helped him in, in the governing of the, of the state. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's such an iconic Piero, and it has this use uh, of geometric, of platonic <laughs> forms, something else that he wrote treatises uh, about. It's, as you pointed out, Paul had this use of a low horizon whereby they become so monumental and seem to um, govern <laughs> by just being there um, the, the country that spreads out um, behind them. Uh, and you have those wonderful backs uh, that are so um, renaissance in conception in the lettering in the um, text that has been chosen, which has a then we also perfect them whereby you can see that the inscription that is here for Batista, is, if you can see it, seeing other people over it. Um, but she's sitting here. She's not in, I can't see her, but she's sitting on the Silaco Rulis, just as Federico is doing her. So they're very clearly presented as rulers, the Silaco Rulis being a ruler's um, chair. Uh, here, um, yeah, lower and coming towards each, each other with those virtues that were all essential to, um, to good government. And so something that Piero painted, um, yeah, for somebody who was, Briefing to give expression to that on a on a private and on a public level, so so maybe um, making you think about expressiveness in Giotto, but also a way whereby this can become and did become a container for the sorrow of the court of Urbino. Um, yeah, we know that it was present in the great wardrobe of the Palazzo, but we don't know where it was before. Um, yeah, but something uh, made to. To commemorate Battista and the, yeah, the great rule of these two together. And I also thought it would be nice to show it because um, Piero, we were just discussing with Francois, and there are so many volumes in the series that are uh, dedicated particularly to, to, to later 16th century, 17th century um, artists and scientists. Um, but um, here we have um, Piero as a great artist, as um, that unlikely superstar maybe of the 15th century, even though he wasn't yet included by, uh, by Ruskin, um, but um, somebody who also became a courtier and by working, he's, he's called the familiare by, um, um, by his uh, co-patriot Luca Pacioli. So he must he was at the court of Urbino and by becoming a courtier, and not only here, but also at the court of Alfonso in Magnanimo in Naples and also in Rimini, he, he was much traveled. And, 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 and the fact that he was um, yeah, that he worked for these people and then also um, repeated what they did within his own home shows, I think, his uh, stature as an artist and the way in which he himself um, called that into, into being. Mm. Th th thank you very much, Bos. I think it's not time to open um, the, the panel, so to speak, to the audience to ask their question. And it is just a, a question of uh, using the reaction button at the bottom and clicking on raise hand. And you can also write me in the chat and, and I'll put your, your question to Ahmed Feld and, and Paul. 
while um, you are thinking or preparing your question, I just have um, one question for you, Maktev. We haven't looked at so much of that, but uh, quite a bit of the work of Piero della Francesca has been dedicated to, to depict marble, precious marble. And I find there's quite a contrast between his mathematical side where everything is very controlled, very organized. And the idea of representing things that correspond to natural movement that create completely random pattern. Is this another side of his personality? Could you see this as perhaps a more um, or less geometric or controlled side of, of his work? What, what, what would be your sense of his, of his use of these uh, natural marble patterns that, that appear in, in various paintings? I think one of the most impressive is um, at the top, this annunciation with uh, it goes into a door. In fact, the door is marble and it looks like, like the sky. It's on the I, I'm listening to you. Yes, no, <laughs> thank you. And, and, and you, in a sense, already gave us the image because you're sitting in front of Tadeo di Bartolo's wonderful blocks yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the, in the chapel in the Palazzo Pubblico in Siena, which is something that Piero also repeated and is something very um, Roman and comes from, from first century Roman painting. Um, yeah, so as you see, he, he used it also in a non-random way. Huh? So, so again, um, looking at the, the geometrical way in which Romans had used um, marble. Um, at the bottom of the, of the cycle in Arezzo, you have um, marbleized panels, or there's, there's uh, marble, um, which must be original, we can tell, because of the giornate and also because um, the fire stools were not placed against the wall in that um, chapel, so it was on view. And there's there's one, they're very random, they're not as precise as the rest of Gero's work. It might be um, Giovanni da Piamonte who, who assisted him uh, and did similar marble, for example, in the in Alberti's Tempietto, the Rucellai Tempietto. Um, so it is clearly looking at antiquity. He also uses in that in that marble pattern a, a fish. All of a sudden, a fish appears, uh, which makes you also think of what uh, Filarete writes about San Marco in Venice, huh? and this idea of of God being the first and the greatest draftsman in in that he drew <laughs> those patterns in marble. Um, yeah, we should all read uh, Fabio Berry's wonderful book, <laughs> Painting in Stone, which has so much to say <laughs> about marble. I wish I'd read that before Absolutely. I wrote this book. <laughs> a couple of iconographic questions. What is the figure depicted as a golden statue on top of the column in the flagellation? Also, is there a specific significance for the chariot being drawn by two unicorns in the triumph of chastity? and the Batista Sforza, beyond the medieval association of unicorns and female chastity. So the, the golden figure on the top of the column in the... Yes, good, good question. Uh, unicorn um, pulling the chariot of chastity. Yeah, Francesca Chieli has pointed out that it very much looks like um, um, a Greek idol, right? so it's, it's very not even Roman, but really Greek in uh, the way the anatomy uh, has been uh, rendered. It's in gold. Um, he holds a globe. Um, the closest parallel is the later, later one. It's a drawing by Dürer uh, in which Apollo is represented. So I have a feeling it has something to do with the representation of Apollo, the son of light, which might also have something to do with that light playing so tantalizingly beautiful on the ceiling over the flagellation. Um, it also has something to do with the mere fact that it is antique and Piero wants to situate um, the flagellation in antiquity. Um, so that's some thoughts on that, um, on that statue. Well, maybe we should show it here. Um, and uh, the other question about the triumph of Batista. Mm -hmm. There she is. Um, yeah, I think uh, those, of course, are the Petrarchan triumphs. Um, so uh, Federico's triumph is more important than that of um, 
Batista, which is second in the Petrarchan sequence. Um, it is chastity, so hence the unicorns. I think it's plural because also Federico has those two wonderful stallions that are a reference also to uh, the triumphs of antiquity. Um, chastity is very important. Um, annoyed that you cannot see the right hand side, you can find images all over on the internet where Batista is actually seated because behind her you have two personifications instead of the one who is standing behind Federico, which is fame. In um, Batista's case, it is um, uh, chastity, so that, that is what you would expect because of the Petrarchan uh, iconography, but there's also Pudicitia, which is a, a, a figure dressed in a very wide um, mantle. Um, and Pudicitia is something that is very important in politics and uh, is not only uh, female uh, chastity and modesty, but also has to do with, uh, to do with foresight and, and with being uh, careful in, in ruling the state. Um, and it is a figure that um, Piero worked on a lot because we know from infrared reflectography that has been done that initially it was nude and he then clad it, which is something that Piero does more often, but it was clearly a figure of consequence to him. So it's it's obviously more than just a triumph from Petrarca, but it's, it's something that he um, tailored to the measure of Batista. I hope that is an answer. Just, just to, 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 to add, um, um... Uh, oh yeah, sure. The, the, the white horses are also the uh, the the horses who draw the the carriage of fame in Petrarch's Triumphy as well. So, so it's it's very much based on Petrarch's poem. Can you please tell us anything about the hand gesture of the Madonna del Partum, her hand on her hip, and the same gesture it seems in the image of the Queen of Sheba to the right? Uh, yes. So here. This mm -hmm. pressure here and also here. Um, see. And here indeed, um, the Madonna del Parto. Um, hmm, difficult one. <laughs> I mean, with the one hand, of course, she's really showing something. The other is also for poise um, and a lot also downcast eyes has to do with propriety of women in public spaces. Um, I also think um, this is something that Dana Prescott, who's a, a wonderful Piero della Francesca lover and uh, was the director of Civitella Ranieri, um, and often took artists to see the Madonna del Parto and she pointed out, it's also very simple and just a plain truth, as is often the case in Piero, uh, a woman who is pregnant um, might rest her hand on her hip like that. <laughs> but um, I'm aware this is not a full answer. But thank you for the question. I should think about that more. 